Menin Ida Theopiliado Achilleus, Sing Goddess, the Rage of Achilles. The very first line of the Iliad sets the scene for its climax. Patroclus, paramour of the king of the Myrmidons, is dead, slain at the hands of Hector, the prince of Troy. In his grief, Achilles' wrath knows no bounds. Consumed with vengeance and bloodlust, no soldier, prince, or even river spirit is a match for the immortal son of Thetis. As the Trojan army flees back behind their gates, one warrior remains outside, the eldest prince of Troy. As Achilles chases Hector around the walls of his city, Zeus considers rescuing him from the Myrmidon's wrath. Alas, Hector's fate has been weighed upon the golden scale, and his life is forfeit. Knowing the gods have abandoned him, the Prince of Troy turns to face his foe and prepares to make his final stand. The showdown between Hector and Achilles is one of the most well-known and enduring scenes in all of Western literature. Yet equal to its impact is the everlasting question, did it really happen? Was there ever a war between the Greeks and the city of Troy? Was there even a city of Troy? In this video, we will compare fact to legend and explore the true history of the iconic Iliad. This episode is brought to you by Intel, thanks to their long-standing partnership with Creative Assembly, and Total War Saga Troy, a brand new strategy game set in the Bronze Age Mediterranean, which dives into the legendary 10-year Trojan War between the kingdoms of Troy and Mycenaean Greece. This new game from the award-winning series allows you to play as one of eight characters, including legendary heroes Achilles and Hector, and fight alongside mythic units including centaurs, minotaurs and giants. This game blends grand strategy, turn-based empire management and spectacular real-time battles. A huge campaign map with 200 plus settlements will give you an opportunity to experience the late Bronze Age in all of its glory. Total War Saga Troy will be available for free if you claim it from the Epic Game Store during the first 24 hours after the launch today. For more information, check out the link below. The real history of the Trojan War is dubious at best. The Iliad itself is inseparable from the magic of the Olympian gods, who constantly provide divine intervention for both sides. In Book 12, Zeus conjures a massive thunderstorm that wreaks havoc through the Greek army, allowing the Trojans to push them all the way back to their ships, only for Poseidon to grow jealous of his brother's power and imbue Ajax with superhuman strength, allowing him to force back the Trojan advance. When this magic is stripped away, is there enough left to prove the existence of a real city of Troy or a great war fought outside its walls? Before we talk about the potential existence of Troy, we should perform a brief survey of the wider world it existed in. The epic cycle, which the Iliad belongs to, is often associated with classical antiquity. This is the most famous era of ancient Greece, and features the golden ages of Athens and Sparta, the iconic Hoplite and the Persian Wars. However, in truth, the stories of Homer's Iliad would have been as distant a memory to a classical Athenian as the fables of King Arthur are to modern Britons. Indeed, to understand the historical context behind the Iliad, we must go back nearly a millennium earlier, to the early Bronze Age, and explore the world of the mysterious Mycenaeans. Rising to prominence around 1600 BC, these ancient forebears to the classical Greeks would have been familiar yet alien to the 5th century Athenian playwright. They worshipped an early form of the Olympian pantheon, and wrote their records in a script known as Linear B, which was wholly distinct from the ancient Greek alphabet. Their power was centered in aristocratic palace complexes across Crete and southern Greece, the most important of which was the titular Mycenae, located in Argos, where the semi-mythical Agamemnon of the House of Atreus was said to have ruled. The Mycenaeans were a thalassocracy, with greater ships than nearly all of their contemporaries. They roamed the seas, growing rich by trade with the Hittites, the Assyrians and Egypt. The Eastern Mediterranean Bronze Age world was tethered by trade connections often established by the ambitious Mycenaean sea lords. However, the Mycenaeans were as much warriors as they were merchants, and as often as they came to trade, so too did they come to conquer. Across the Mediterranean, 
the sight of bird-beaked prows atop Mycenaean galleys struck fear into all who saw them. This golden age was not to last, for in the early 12th century BC, all the great civilizations of the eastern Mediterranean, save Egypt, would all topple in a crash of apocalyptic proportions known as the Bronze Age Collapse. What brought about this destruction of civilization remains a mystery, but is most likely linked to the brutal invasions of the vaguely defined Sea Peoples, among them possibly some Mycenaean pirates. Whatever their origin, the great Bronze Age palaces of Mycenae were entirely abandoned in their wake, and in the fallout, Ancient Greece entered a four-century-long period known as its Dark Ages. Trade links were severed, towns shrunk, society became more rural, and artwork became more simplistic. Most importantly, Linear B was abandoned, giving way to an illiterate society. However, even as the Greeks of the Dark Ages became centuries removed from the palaces of Mycenae, they never forgot the stories of the great kings, heroes, and wars of their mighty seafaring ancestors. Over time, the Mycenaean era came to be seen as a more magical age, where gods and spirits walked freely amongst mortals. To the Peloponnesian shepherd, the gods were real as earth and water, and their presence in an ancient tale did not compromise its realism. Without a writing system, these stories were preserved orally from generation to generation. One poet who probably existed at the end of the period was Homer. Modern historians are split on whether Homer was one man or a series of chroniclers building upon each other's works, so for the sake of linearity, we will choose to depict him as the former. The seminal poet told the story of a vast armada of ships that had once set out across the Aegean Sea to lay siege to the great city of Troy. This story was the memory of an ancient war, so grand in scope that all the gods of Olympus were bound to interfere. By the time Greek civilization re-emerged from the Dark Ages, Homer's fantastical epic had been forever branded into its social memory, magnified by playwrights like Euripides and Sophocles. Thus far, we have explained how the Homeric tradition of classical Greece is essentially the mythicized memory of the Mycenaean Bronze Age that preceded it. With that said, to answer whether the Trojan War was real, we must jump far ahead in time to the late Victorian Age and dive down the rabbit hole of 19th century archaeology. The modern historiography of Troy is tied to an amateur German scholar, Heinrich Schliemann, to some the father of modern archaeology, to others a conman and thief. Schliemann was a massive admirer of Greek antiquities, and at some point in the 1860s, decided to dedicate his life to the search for ancient Troy. Fortunately for him, he was friends with Frank Calvert, a British diplomat in the Ottoman Empire, who just so happened to own a piece of land, a mound called Hisalik, which he claimed to be the site of Homer's great city. Allowed to excavate Hisalik, the German archaeologist began with Fergal in 1870. As his team dug straight down, Schliemann was overjoyed to find not one, but nine ancient cities, all built atop one another throughout the last 3,000 years. These archaeological layers were promptly named Troy 1 through Troy 9. The German asserted that the second deepest, and therefore the second oldest site, Troy 2, was the city from the Iliad. He even liberated a collection of bronze and gold artifacts from that lair, and draped them over his problematically young wife, dubbing them Priam's treasure. In truth, Troy II most likely dated back to 2300 BC or earlier, a thousand years before the Trojan War could have taken place. To confound matters, in his haste to get to the bottom ruins, Schliemann had carelessly thrown out the artifacts found in Troy 6 through 9, the sites more likely to actually be Homer's Troy. Schliemann died in 1890, leaving behind an ethically questionable legacy and never having discovered the true city featured in the Iliad. Nevertheless, if there ever was a Troy, then the site of Hisalak was the most likely location for it. To explain why, we must jump back to the Bronze Age. By the early 1200s BC, 
the warlike Mycenaeans had conquered the Aegean Islands, the ancient civilization of Crete, and much of the southwestern Anatolian coastline. This expansion put them on the doorstep of another bellicose empire, the Hittites. Feuding between the Hittites and Mycenaeans was nothing new at that point, and with the two civilizations' spheres of influence inching closer and closer to one another, total war was a possibility. In this climate, northwestern Anatolia was beginning to look more and more like a juicy catch, a crucial borderland between two warlike, expansionist peoples. Troy itself was strategically crucial for both empires. Therefore, if there ever was a Trojan War, then it likely took place around the 1200s BCE at the apex of Mycenaean territorial expansion, and was surely an attempt by the Mycenaeans to secure a foothold against their Hittite rivals. Such a geopolitically crucial conflict could well have served as the basis from which the legend of the Iliad was born. Based on the discovery of an inscribed seal at the Hisalic site by modern archaeologists, the modern consensus is that the Trojans themselves were Luwian, an Anatolian people closely related to the Hittites. While the Trojans of the Iliad appear to anachronistically follow the religious rites of the Greeks' Olympian gods, other clues to their Luwian Anatolian culture can be found in Homer's epic. The name of King Priam, for example, is likely derived from the Luwian title Pariamua, meaning exceptionally courageous, while his son Paris' name likely originates from Parisitis, another attested title among the Luwians of unknown meaning. In the Iliad, Priam practices polygamy, a custom commonly associated with Bronze Age Anatolian kings, while Paris is a renowned marksman, drawing parallels to Anatolian warriors, who unlike the Greeks, were excellent archers. Furthermore, the young prince's characterization as a vain and effeminate pretty boy may be the legacy of the Mycenaean outlook on the culture of the Anatolians, which they reductively saw as more hedonistic than their own. Perhaps the most compelling parallels we can draw belong to Helen, the face that launched a thousand ships. Noble women of Hittite-related cultures tended to have more freedom and political influence than their Greek contemporaries. Homeric tradition relates that Helen was whisked away from her home in Sparta by the goddess of love Aphrodite and delivered to Paris to be his bride. In truth, if there ever was a real Helen, she may well have been a Mycenaean queen of Spartan origin. However, her elopement with a Trojan prince was certainly not born of godly intervention, but likely the result of an ambitious woman seeking to escape the confines of Greek social norms by fleeing to a land where freedom and power were more possible. Overall, these surviving glimpses of Luwian Hittite culture among the Trojan nobles of the Iliad all point to the fact that Homer was indeed telling a mythicized version of a war that happened between Proto-Greeks and Anatolians, albeit from the distorted perspective of a Greek living 400 years after the conflict. Other kernels of reliable historiography in Homer's writings add further evidence that this great war took place in real life. In Book 2 of the Iliad, the seminal poet lists off the contingents of allies in the United Greek Army, a list that has a remarkable amount of similarities to the locations of late Mycenaean archaeological sites. Later Homeric tradition relates that when the Greeks returned from Troy, their country fell into chaos and infighting, which corresponds with the fact that our presumed date for the Trojan War takes place right before the Bronze Age collapse. Perhaps the conquest of Troy was a last-ditch effort by the kings of Mycenae to preserve their power and prestige before their civilization crumbled into dust. It is not only Greek sources that shared evidence of a great clash at Troy. Surviving Hittite texts are full of many mentions of the Ahiyawa people, particularly their role in aiding the Asua Rebellion, a confederation of Hittite client cities on the west coast of Anatolia, including a certain Willusia that rose up in revolt against their imperial overlords around 1500 BC. Willusia was almost certainly Troy, and its name could be from where the Greek name for the city, Ilios, was derived. Meanwhile, the Ahiyawa were of course the Mycenaeans, 
always eager to help anyone willing to rebel against their Hittite rivals. The word Ahiyawa itself is probably a corruption of the word Achaeans. As compelling as it might be to link the Asua rebellion to the Trojan War, it is an unlikely match for a few reasons. Firstly, Hittite records claim that the Greeks and Trojans were allied in this conflict. Secondly, the insurrection was eventually crushed by the Hittite king Tudhelia II. Finally, this conflict took place 200 years before the Trojan War most likely happened. However, the existence of these battles in the Hittite records shows that the struggle between them and the Mycenaeans for the city of Troy was well underway by the Mid-Bronze Age, making it very possible that the Proto-Greeks would try to establish control over the city again in later centuries. We've now accumulated a healthy amount of historical literary evidence that the Trojan War could well have happened. But does the archaeological evidence line up with the clues left behind by ancient chroniclers? Despite Schliemann's initial bungling, the excavation site was thankfully taken over in 1890 by a more competent Wilhelm Derpfeld. Unlike Schliemann, who dug down as far as he could, Derpfeld focused his efforts on the excavation of the comparatively newer layer of Troy VI. Through painstaking labour, he managed to unveil the remains of an elevated citadel that had once boasted high walls and towers of stone, and large houses within it for the rich and powerful. Dated to have been inhabited from 1700 to 1250 BC, Troy VI fit well into the timeline of Homer's war. However, evidence of its eventual destruction pointed not to an invasion of Mycenaean Greeks, but rather a natural disaster, earthquake. This revelation shook the scholarly world and led many to create fringe theories that the destruction of Troy in the Iliad was not a literal war, but instead a metaphor. Poseidon was the Olympian god of earthquakes, and the horse was his sacred beast. Could it be that the iconic wooden horse that destroyed Troy was not a physical object, but Mycenaean chroniclers interpreting Troy's natural destruction as a manifestation of Poseidon's wrath? These theories would persist until the 1930s, when an American archaeologist named Kyle Blegen took charge at the Hasalik site. His work centered around the site of Troy 7 and revealed something remarkable. Firstly, Troy 7 was not a new city at all, but the same city as Troy 6, rebuilt upon the same foundations after the earthquake. Secondly, its existence was punctuated by war. Within what had once been its fortified citadel, houses that had once belonged to individual wealthy families were now subdivided, as if made to house an influx of refugees. The pithoi that had once stored grain, wine and olive oil were buried to make them last longer. All signs pointed to the fact that Troy 7 was a city under siege. Blegen also found signs of fire damage and arrowheads, potentially of Mycenaean make. Blegen's discoveries would be built upon in 1988, when the excavations of one Manfred Kaufmann on the site of Troy 7 revealed that all archaeologists who had come before him had barely scratched the surface. While they had focused their excavations around Troy's elevated citadel and main palace, Kaufmann's meticulous dig team revealed the existence of an entire massive lower city, complete with homes, walls, and an underground water system that had been used by the Trojans for 2,000 years. Like the citadel above it, the lower city displayed a scene of desperation. Evidence of fire damage was widespread, arrowheads were embedded into the walls of homes, skeletons of the dead remained unburied, and piles of sling stones lay on the streets for the city's defenders to hurl upon the enemy invading their home. It was almost certainly war that brought down the city of Troy sometime in the early 12th century BC. So did that legendary duel between Achilles of the Greeks and Hector of the Trojans happen? Most likely not. But was there a great city of Troy? The evidence both literary and archaeological tells us almost certainly yes. Finally, did an armada of Greek warriors ever sail across the Aegean and do battle upon its mighty walls? That we may never know for sure. 
But as archaeologists continue to explore the remains of the once great ancient city, it becomes evident that there is some truth to Homer's legend. We will continue exploring the semi-mythical stories of the past, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.